There we go. Hi, everybody. Welcome to class. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center, and I'm really excited about this class topic. We're going to talk about slavery in America, and we're going to look at slavery in the North America from pre-Constitution all the way to the Reconstruction Amendments, so around like 1880s. And to guide us through our learning today, we are here with Tom Donnelly. He, I will always say this, he is our top scholar at the National Constitution Center, but he's also our chief content officer. Tom, I'm getting that right this time, correct? Uh, yes, that's right. There's lots of chiefs in this class today. <laughs> so let's get started, Tom. How, why do you love to talk about and teach this course? Like what is your you know, most interesting part of learning about this topic that we're gonna go through today? I think it's an amazing topic, both to make sure that we're teaching all of American history and all of its greatness and all of its uh, downsides. And I think it, this story of the history of slavery in America, it has a lot of you know, really sad stories, but it also has many very inspirational stories of people you know, fighting against this institution, fighting to leave enslavement. Um, and it takes a great amount of, like so many great uh, uh, movements in American constitutional history, it takes an amazing amount of both principle, so arguments going back to the founding documents, but also courage. And that's just written all throughout, I think, uh, talking about this topic of slavery in America. Tom, that was perfect. And you're absolutely right. And I completely agree. It is such a heart-wrenching conversation when we talk about America and we look at slavery being embedded into the American um, existence from the beginning to and the lingering effects of it today. But I think you're so absolutely right. It's not, the heart-wrenching parts are sometimes so sad, but they're also unbelievably heart-bursting parts with the amazing heroes that we have in our history people who have fought and never saw freedom for themselves, but ensured that our country would do better and live up to the values that we believe in. So we're really gonna walk through and make sure our students understand how was slavery before the constitution and how did it work differently in this country than other countries? And then how did we change and end slavery with the constitution itself? So looking at that constitution through the whole storyline. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about, do, should we kick it off and look at slavery in the colonies? Yeah, I think that's a great place to start, Kurt. Awesome. Okay, so pre-Constitution, so we're talking, you know, 1650s here, like give us that time frame and then kick us off. I mean, this, is, this, this part of the story is a reminder that slavery itself is older than the U.S. Constitution. It's older than America as a nation. So slavery itself, it's written into colonial law as early as the 1660s in places like Virginia, the Carolinas. And by the 1700s, these colonial slave codes transformed slavery itself. It made slavery inheritable. In other words, it was passed down from mother to child. It's a lifelong condition based on race. This is known as chattel slavery. And so this is just a fundamental shift in how the institution of slavery worked. And what we'd see as we get into the 1700s, Curry, is that American slavery expands. And so to give you just an example of Virginia, enslaved people end up growing from just 7% of the population in 1680 to a whopping 46% by 1750. So slavery becomes a massive part of the Southern population and also of white Southern wealth. But it's also important to remember that the story of slavery isn't just a Southern story. We have enslavement in the North, but the other thing we see is we move towards getting closer to um, uh, you know, the Constitutional Convention, we see also the beginning of the push for emancipation. And so part of this is literally just getting the Declaration of Independence in 1776 and writing into our nation's creed, this, this idea, this inspiring vision of us all being created equal, born free and equal with certain natural rights that we get just from being human beings. This idea of freedom and equality, it's written right into the American DNA there at the beginning in 1776. What we see as we, after the Declaration of Independence, is we see a push towards emancipation in the North. So we see Vermont ending slavery in its 1777 constitution. We see a state Supreme Court decision ending slavery in Massachusetts in 1783. And in Pennsylvania, we see the first of a series of gradual emancipation bills being passed in 1780. Now this uh, gradual emancipation in, in many cases is quite gradual. So if you take, for instance, Pennsylvania, what that law says is that people who are currently enslaved they aren't going to be freed, but that their children will eventually be freed. When, they, when their children turn 28 years old, they will be freed. 
So we see here in the North already before the Constitutional Convention, a push towards emancipation. So we see sort of an entrenchment of the institution of slavery in the South and the beginning of a push towards emancipation in the North. And I think there's a, a really good point on those, the, um, the uh, emancipation, gradual emancipation bills. They're really gradual. I think one of the last enslaved people was finally freed in Pennsylvania right before the Civil War breaks out. So it is very gradual. Um, Tom, as we dive into this, I think it's so important that you point out we are, you know, at this point in time in the 1780s, we are at the end of the Revolutionary War where we told the world in the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, that you are given, and the founding principle around that, one of them, is at least you have natural rights that you're born with. You're even given by God or nature, and no government and no man shall take them away from you. They walk in with this mindset to a convention to start to begin to build a new governing document, the Constitution. And how does slavery and the embodiment of slavery in our laws play out at the convention? So I'll let you kind of set the stage there, but it's like they have these great ideals and then they walk in to write down how it's going to work and how does that flesh out together? Does it come into conflict? Yeah, absolutely. So there are big debates at the convention over the institution of slavery. We're just looking at the convention delegates themselves, 25 of 55 held enslaved people. So slavery is critical to many of the delegates' wealth and to the economies of their home states. We're looking at sort of the big picture here, Curie. I mean, some things to note, the delegates took great care to not, not write the word slave or slavery into the Constitution. They also didn't provide explicit protection to the so-called right to property in men. However, they did forge a series of key compromises over slavery, which provided some protections, some key protections for slaveholders. Furthermore, they left the really big question of whether to have slavery or not, yes or no, not to the national government, but to each state making their own decision about the institution of slavery. Got it. So when we talk about that no property in man, it, it sounds like kind of like the wording can sound a little tricky there, but how much of a big deal is that? So the idea that they ensured that there was nowhere in the constitution that said you could own another human being. How much, because in a minute, we're going to talk about where they did protect slavery in the Constitution. Let's talk about, like, it, like in a way, like, if they put property and man in the Constitution, how, how much different would it have been? And I hate to do those hypotheticals, but I want to just kind of weight the impact of ensuring that, that those words weren't in the Constitution. Well, I think for someone to, just projecting ahead, for someone like Frederick Douglass, it would have changed quite a bit. Um, I mean, what Frederick Douglass and many anti-slavery and abolitionist voices are able to say as we get into the 1800s is that the Constitution is not a pro-slavery document, that it has many dimensions to it. They're pointing in the direction of freedom. That would have been really difficult to say if you're specifically writing a protection for the right to property and men in the Constitution. So they can look at the Constitution and say there are, or are certain protections, certain compromises that had to be forged. Uh, for slavery in order to bring the slaveholding states into the union. But in the end, the Constitution doesn't double down on the big principle itself. Awesome. Okay, so let's talk about where they put protections, or they, they basically talk about slavery without using the word slavery in the Constitution. So these are what's called clauses of the Constitution. And this is the structural Constitution, people. So this is the original Constitution that was ratified in 17, um, that was given to the people in 1787, pre-Bill of Rights, so just context there. So what are these, can you walk us through these three big clauses? Yeah, so these are the three big compromises at the convention over the institution of slavery. It's the three-fifths compromise, the compromise over the fugitive slave clause, and the compromise over the slave trade clause. So just beginning with the three-fifths clause. So here, this is arguably the most important of the compromises over, over slavery. And so just as a reminder, the U.S. House of Representatives, it draws up its districts based on a state's population. So the more populous a state, the more representatives they get in the U.S. House of Representatives. And over time, the more representatives you have in the U.S. House of Representatives, the more political power you have. And so it's very important for each state how many representatives it has in there. And as we move forward in American history, it becomes very important how many representatives are from the North versus from the South. And so the key question in this debate was how do we count enslaved people for purposes of congressional representation? And so for the slaveholding delegates, they say that's easy. We should count our enslaved people as five fifths of a person. 
as a full person. We may not treat them as full people, but we think that we should get full credit for them as people to boost our political power in the U.S. House of Representatives. On the flip side, anti-slavery voices stepped in at the convention and said, no, 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 that's hypocrisy. You don't count, you don't treat enslaved people as full people. You shouldn't get extra credit, extra political power based on how many enslaved people you hold. So enslaved people, we think they're full people. We think they're five fifths. We think you should give them full rights. But if you don't do that, then they should count as zero fifths. You shouldn't get a boost in Congress of your power based on how many people you enslave. In the end, the convention reaches a compromise, the three fifths compromise, which counts enslaved people as three fifths of a person for purposes of how many seats a state's gonna get in the US House of Representatives. And over time, this has great effect, it great effects on political power in the United States because it, it boosts the representation of the slaveholding states in the US House of Representatives, and then boosts their power in the electoral college because the number of votes you get in the electoral college is based on how many members of Congress you have. And furthermore, based on you know who is then elected president, those presidents will then appoint who ends up on the Supreme Court. So the three-fifths compromise really radiates out throughout the decades ahead. It's a huge ricochet effect um, of power that shifts. So Tom, thank you for pointing that out. I also, I, I, and you also pointed out, and I just wanna amplify it, that they're, count, they're counted as three-fifths of person, not because they have the rights of three-fifths of a person, but for representation. So they have no rights or very few rights. Now, we, today we thought we'd really focus on people, people, that fought this fought, fought this fight um, and tried to push back on slavery and some people that fought to keep slavery. So perfect lineup for one of our great heroes that at the Constitutional Convention said, no, this is wrong. So can you talk about Governor Morris just for a little bit? I could talk about Governor Morris all day long, um, but could you talk a little bit about him at the convention and how he stood up at that moment and said, no, we all know this is wrong and stands against our ideals. Absolutely. So Governor Morris, he's an important delegate from Pennsylvania. He's an ally of Benjamin Franklin. In many ways at the convention, he is the most ardently uh, anti-slavery voice. And so as we're having these debates over the three-fifths compromise and also over the international slave trade, he is in the convention saying, no, 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 you Southern slaveholding delegates, in the case of the three-fifths clause, you're hypocrites. I mean, he calls slavery, quote, an authoritarian institution, the curse of heaven on the states where it prevailed. And so many of the strongest, most stridently anti-slavery uh, arguments that you find at the convention are from Governor Morris. Governor Morris had a vision of you know, a powerful national government. Uh, that's in part what he was trying to accomplish with the new constitution. He's also known as the penman of the constitution because he, he helped create the final draft in the committee of style. But for our purposes, he was also a key anti-slavery voice. Uh, and I liked that you called him the penman. This is very uh, committee of style, but I actually like that. Uh, title better. Very cool. Um, so let's jump to the next big clause, and that's the Fugitive Slave Clause. Sure, so the Fugitive Slave Clause, is re it's really, really important, but there's actually very little debate over it at the Constitutional Convention. Its language is drawn from the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, so that could be in part why there's not a big debate. It's language that everyone's familiar with, but basically it allows, this clause allows Southern slaveholders to go into Northern states to retrieve enslaved people who had escaped from enslavement. And so we'd see a lot of battles as we get into the 1800s over how broadly this power sweeps and what's, what, what free states can do to prevent Southern slaveholders and slave catchers from coming into the Northern states and taking African-Americans back down to the slaveholding South. Awesome, and then the next one, slave trade clause. Okay, so this, this uh, slave trade clause is all about the international slave trade. So by the founding, even many slaveholders end up opposing the inhumane Atlantic slave trade. And it's really only delegates from the Deep South, so from South Carolina and Georgia, who still support this practice. And South Carolina actually threatens to leave the convention over this issue. There are some delegates who say, this is our time in the Constitution. Let's abolish the Atlantic slave trade. Other delegates, again, importantly, from places like Georgia and South Carolina, the Deep South, say no. If you abolish the international slave trade, you can say goodbye to the union. We're just gonna leave this convention and you're stuck with the Articles of Confederation in that weak form of government. And once again, the convention ends up making a compromise saying that Congress will have the power to ban the international slave trade, but not until January 1st, 1808. So not until 20 years after the ratification of the constitution. And this has great practical consequences because between 1788 
in 1808, there are 200,000 additional enslaved people brought from Africa into the United States. In 1808, Congress finally has the power to abolish the international slave trade, and it does. And a great question from Randy here. Um, how did they pick 1808? Like, where did that come from? Was it just because it was about 20 years or what is it? Yeah, so it's interesting. So, you know, there were supporters at the convention. I, for instance, I think Madison, who said, if we're going to delay, let's, 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 let's make it 1800. So it's like we're coming to a new century and we can change. Uh, you know, at that point, we, you know, we can make this big change. It seems like a natural point to do that. But, you know, in the end, you still had the 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 uh, the delegates from the Deep South pushing and saying, no, 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 we want we want this practice to just continue. So I think it was just a matter of a compromise between allowing the international slave trade forever and had Congress having no power versus this end point of 1800. There's actually a great uh, uh, if you look on our website in the inter uh, the uh, interactive constitution, there's a nice essay on this clause that can that tells you a little bit about that history. Awesome. So the next question for you um, is let's talk a little bit about people that were resisting from the beginning and people like Prince Hall, since we are going to focus on some of the greats today, the great people that fought back right away. So this is even before the Constitution, and this really kicks off that beginning anti-slavery abolitionist movement. Yeah, Prince Hall is a great reminder that the push for uh, the abolitionist push, the anti-slavery push, it's there in, as part of the American story from the very beginning. And so Prince Hall, he's a free African-American in Boston. It's 1777. And he offers a petition for freedom to the Massachusetts House on behalf of seven African-Americans. And effectively what he does is he echoes the Declaration of Independence. And he says, we are all born free and equal in the institution of slavery. It violates natural law. And so he's telling the Massachusetts House, it is time to abolish this practice here in Massachusetts. And finally, it, 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 at, at as early as 1783, we see the Massachusetts High Court saying yes, and they declared slavery unconstitutional as violating the Massachusetts Constitution and violating natural rights, just as Prince Hall argued. Awesome. So there were other people fighting against slavery as well. And this was at the convention and also after the convention. So maybe we take real quick beat on um, Ben Franklin. Sure. So, you know, Benjamin Franklin, he, he, he has a near the end of his life, you're a push to present an anti-slavery petition before the first Congress. So Pennsylvania it has the first abolitionist society in the country. It's founded in April 1775. So even before the Declaration of Independence, in part, it's because Quakers take a lead role in the abolitionist movement. And so a decade later, Benjamin Franklin's elected the society's president. Um, and in his final public act, he sends a petition signed in February 1790 to Congress on behalf of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society calling for the abolition of slavery and an end to the international slave trade. So this is Benjamin Franklin's final act. It's an act on behalf of abolition. Perfect. Okay, so now we get past the Constitutional Convention, the ratification of the Constitution. We'll even zoom past adding a Bill of Rights and really build up with that conversation around the anti-slavery movement. So we move from, you know, Prince Hall being, you know, one of very few people fighting back against uh, slavery, but still there being voices to a growing kind of push of the abolitionist movement um, and anti-slavery movement and the pushback as well. And that builds up the pressure to the Civil War. So Tom, we can jump kind of anywhere at this point, but I always like to jump around to always my favorites, um, but we can go to Frederick Douglass and Harriet Scott are the two people that I'm thinking we can move to next. But if you wanna do some of the pushback as well to help people, people that were trying to hold on to slavery, we can talk about those people as well. Yeah, maybe just a little a little overview and then we'll go to, to Frederick Douglass and Harriet Scott because I love, uh, love tackling both of them as well. I mean, one thing that's a, important to remember today in the 21st century is we look at abolitionists, anti-slavery movement, those folks, they're the good guys. They're fighting against this awful institution. And so we see them on the side of right um, and surely they're going to win this battle, but it's important to know in their own time, especially in the early 1800s, they're deeply unpopular, not just in the South, but also in the North. They're seen as rabble rousers, as sowing sort of dissension of a disagreement between the North and the South to bring division to America. And so to be an abolitionist, to be an anti-slavery voice in the early 1800s takes great courage because you're gonna be shunned. You're gonna be hated. You might be the subject of violence, even murder. 
And so in the end, these are really courageous people, but the movement itself, it grows as we go into the, get further and further into the 1800s. It's a multiracial movement, so it has African-Americans and white Americans, it has men, it has women, it's a very diverse movement. And in part, you know, some of the big debates we see as we get into the 1800s are over the very nature of the constitution itself. And so we see, you know, pro-slavery Southerners like John C. Calhoun look at the constitution, look at the compromises we talked about and said, of course the constitution's a pro-slavery document. We never would have joined the union if it wasn't. So how dare you argue otherwise? And then we see divisions among abolitionists and anti-slavery folks over how to read the constitution. On the one hand, we have the Garrisonians led by William Lloyd Garrison, in effect, agreeing with John C. Calhoun and looking at the constitution and saying, yes, it is a pro-slavery document and that's why we have to get rid of it. And so the Garrisonians end up burning the constitution. They argue that it's an agreement with death and a covenant with hell. Um, and you know, in the end, they're ironically echoing a lot of the arguments from pro-slavery voices like John C. Calhoun. They say, we abolitionists, we have to get out of politics. We have to turn away from the constitution and we need to reform Americans from the inside. We need to turn their souls, not be involved in grubby politics. But we see plenty of voices on the other side of the abolitionist movement pushing back. And in many ways, the most powerful voice may have been Frederick Douglass. And in part, the reason his voice is so powerful in this context, apart from the fact that he is Frederick Douglass and one of the great <laughs> you know, thinkers and speakers in all of American history was that he began his career as a Garrisonian, but he later changes his mind. And in a famous speech, Douglas reads the constitution as a quote, glorious liberty document. And so well, Calhoun and Garrison, they look at the constitution, they see a pro-slavery document. Frederick Douglass looks at the constitution. He says, look, we, I don't see the word slave or slavery in the constitution. Furthermore, if you look at so many key parts of the constitution, they don't point in the direction of enslavement they point in the direction of liberty. Places like the, the inspiring preamble, speaking of we the people. Places like, um, you know, he even looked at the three-fifths clause and said, look, that at least recognizes the partial humanity, the humanity of African-Americans. And he looked at places like the Fifth, the Fifth Amendment's due process clause, which speaks of liberty and says, yes, the constitution is pointing in the direction of liberty, not enslavement. And here's what he said. Its language is we the people, not we the white people, not even we the citizens, not we the privileged class, not we the high, not we the low, but we the people. If the South has made the constitution bend to the purposes of slavery, let the North now make that instrument bend to the cause of freedom and justice. I love that. I want it on a t-shirt so bad. Uh, it's like one of the best lines ever. Um, it, uh, Tom, is this speech or this document that he writes this in, in our founder's library, because I just want to note that so I can send it out to everybody. Yes, so we have two big speeches from Douglas where he makes these sorts of arguments. What to the slave is the 4th of July, he makes it there, but he's, there's another one called the constitution, is it pro-slavery or anti-slavery? And both of those documents are on the founder's library. Perfect, and everybody, this great tool that we have online is the founder's library and we'll send it out to you. And these are also cool. weaved into our new curriculum. Now, talking about another great court case that's in the Founders Library, but better to tell the story of Harriet Scott. So this is the, um, the case that we so often talk about right before we get to the Civil War, and we talk about the Dred Scott v. Stanford case, and we almost always talk about the Chief Justice in this case. Uh, but we have a conversation that goes on at the Constitution Center about storytelling and whose voice and whose agency do we tell? So as we were all digging into these stories, we just found so much power in Harriet's story. So Tom, can you tell the story of Harriet Scott and her powerful movement as a female and a mom? Sure, so Harriet Scott, she's, she's up there on the screen. She was an enslaved mother. She had two young daughters. And in effect, what she wanted to make sure is she wanted to make sure that her daughters didn't have to live under the institution of slavery. They want, she wanted to make sure they weren't enslaved. And so she pushed to bring the family's case to the courts. This is a case arguing that we are free. And the argument was pretty simple. It was, yes, we were enslaved, but we were brought under free soil. And that makes us free. And this is, these were known as personal liberty suits. We see a lot of them during this period. But Harriet Scott is importantly pushing her family in the direction of going to court and fighting for their freedom. In the end, the Supreme Court closes the door on the, 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 the Scott family's freedom in this context. It's an opinion by Chief Justice Roger Brooke Taney. And effectively it says two really big things. One, it says that African-Americans can't be United States citizens. And second, that African-Americans had quote, no rights 
which the white man was bound to respect. So in many ways, the Dred Scott decision is the most infamous slavery decision in a decision on the institution of slavery in Supreme Court history. But importantly, Chief Justice Taney's arguments don't get unanswered. So one, the Scots themselves are answering Chief Justice Taney in the Supreme Court saying, we think you're wrong. But then it's not just them saying it. We also see two powerful dissents in the Dred Scott case by Justice Benjamin Curtis and Justice John McLean. So we see on the court itself, key justices saying, no, Chief Justice Taney, you've got the Constitution's text and history wrong. Of course, African-Americans can be United States citizens. They have been citizens throughout our history. Furthermore, they do have rights, which the white man is bound to respect. But furthermore, these arguments aren't just happening in the Supreme Court. They reverberate then in American politics. They're echoed by abolitionists and anti-slavery voices outside the courts. They're also echoed by important politicians, like President, like by Abraham Lincoln. So Abraham Lincoln, in part, when he's having his famous debates with Stephen A. Douglas in the, in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, part of what he's arguing about is the Dred Scott decision, saying the Supreme Court got it wrong. And so we see coming out of Dred Scott and moving towards the Civil War, we see the Republican Party emerge as our nation's first real powerful anti-slavery party. And Abraham Lincoln in 1860 is elected as our nation's first anti-slavery president, which of course brought in secession and then a civil war. So, okay, so we get secession, we, we get Lincoln, we get secession, uh, the breaking of the South from um, the Union, and then we get the Civil War. Now, this rolls into, and this is our wrap up story here, but this rolls into my other favorite person to talk about this week. Um, the story of enslaved people during the Civil War fighting back and constantly, it's a, the story of enslavement is a story of tragedy, but also constant resistance, resistance in the smallest ways and resistance in the biggest ways. And Tom and I now vote that we believe that Robert Small should be the story that we all tell to everybody because this story is one of those huge ways. This is like one of those epic American stories. You almost can't believe the story is real. So I'm sorry, I'm giving it a lot of hype, but Tom, tell us the story about Robert Smalls and while the um, Civil War is going on and throughout his entire life, how he resisted on all different levels to end slavery. Absolutely. So Robert Smalls, he's born an enslaved person in South Carolina in 1839. And a little over 20 years later, he had won his freedom for his entire family, and he was celebrated as a Civil War, a Civil War hero. He'd later emerge as a political leader. But his act of courage comes in May of 1862. So he's serving on a Confederate ship. Um, he's serving as the ship's pilot. And in the end, he's, he's there with other African-American crewmates. Their, 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 their white captain and other white crew members decide to leave the ship. Um, and so Smalls is left there with the other African-American crew members. And Smalls had been plotting for weeks for this very moment saying, you know, if I have the opportunity, I'm going to try to use my position here to bring my own freedom, the freedom of my crewmates, but also the freedom of our families. So we have the white crewmates off on shore in Charleston. The boat itself is in Charleston Harbor. And so at three o'clock in the morning on May 12th, 1862, Robert Smalls and his African-American crewmates, they begin sailing the ship. They sail it to a wharf where they pick up members of their family. And then it's in the dark of night, they drive through Charleston Harbor, through the Confederate lines. And so you have Robert Smalls here. He knows his captain, the white captain really well. So he dons the captain's cap. He knows a lot of his mannerisms. He knows to fold his arms. And so in the dark of night, he looks like the captain. And so he knows all the right hand signals to give to the Confederate forces along the way. There are a bunch of different checkpoints, including at Fort Sumter, which was the starting point of the Civil War itself. And so he, he and his crewmates sail through enemy lines, through Confederate lines, all the way through and finally to the Union blockade. As they're approaching the Union blockade, they, they bring down the Confederate flag and the South Carolina flag, and they put up a white flag, which is actually sheets that Robert Small's wife had brought on board to signal that they are surrendering the vessel uh, to the Union Navy. Um, and in the end, they, they surrender the vessel. Smalls himself has all sorts of intelligence about the Confederate forces and what they're doing in the Charleston Harbor, shares that with the Union Navy. He would then go on to serve you know, courageously in battle. He would be promoted to captain himself and he would become the captain of his old vessel, the planter, as part of the US Navy. He would eventually through Congress be awarded $1,500 for, uh, for uh, taking this ship and bringing it to the Union Navy. He would then use that money to buy the estate of his old enslaver, 
And so back in South Carolina, he, he'd buy the old estate that he was formerly an enslaved person in, and he would emerge in South Carolina as a really, really important political leader. He would serve in the 1864 Republican National Convention, so the convention that renominated Lincoln for the presidency. In 1868, he served in the South Carolina State Constitutional Convention, rewriting the South Carolina State Constitution after the Civil War to write promises of freedom and equality into the South Carolina Constitution. That same year, he's elected to the State House of Representatives. In 1872, he's elected to the South Carolina Senate. And finally, in 1874, he's elected to serve in the US House of Representatives, serving five terms between 1875 in 1887. And so Robert Smalls is this great reminder of the unbelievable transformations that happened around the Civil War and Reconstruction. Robert Smalls using his brains and his courage to bring freedom to himself, his family, and his crewmates. We'd see during the Civil War, the national government moving towards emancipation. So the most famous example there is President Abraham Lincoln using his war powers as president to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed all enslaved people held within the Confederacy. And then finally, after the Civil War, after Union victory, we would see African-Americans pushing hard to ensure that we set better constitutional baselines for post-Civil War America. Part of this is a result of the courage of African-Americans during the Civil War itself, fleeing plantations, signing up for the Union Army. Part of it is having African-Americans meeting together in convention, arguing and in the end, telling the rest of America what it was going to take to ensure a new birth of freedom for African Americans after the Civil War. And finally, it was up to we the people to change the very Constitution itself after the Civil War, ratifying a series of three amendments, the Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th Amendment ratified in 1865, which abolished slavery, the 14th Amendment ratified in 1868, which wrote the promises of freedom and equality into the Constitution, the 15th Amendment ratified in 1870, banning racial discrimination and voting. In the end, it's these amendments together with all of that courage that we saw from people from Robert Smalls all the way down that ensured what many scholars call America's second founding, the true transformation of the American constitution. Tom, that was perfect. And you led us perfectly through you know, the heroic stories of Robert Smalls, his crewmates and his family that continued all the way through his whole life, calling and showing the world of how many African-American soldiers fought for these freedoms, the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendment being called by the Colored People's Conventions to add those promises of freedom and equality to the Constitution and to ensure that Congress had power to enforce these amendments. Not that it always did. And that's another story to bring us all the way to the Civil Rights Movement of 1965 to 1968 and how that really starts to answer all the components in these amendments, but also the freedom to vote and have voice and agency. So Tom, thank you so much for all this great conversation, that awesome story. It still blows me away and I can hear it a million times over. Students, thank you so much for the great conversations. If you have any questions, please let me know, but we know we're about three minutes over time. So we're gonna wrap up and send you a bunch of tools to read after class. Thank you, everyone. Have Thanks, a great everyone. day. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Greg.